When this photograph was taken in 1974, I was just one year old. And I love this photo. It has a very symbolic meaning to me. Because the man on the left, that is Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari. And what's remarkable about the photo is that it was not taken on a vacation, but that hot tub was standing in the Atari office. And it was one of the first investments that Atari made from their profits was to buy that, the hot top for their team. And there's an interesting anecdote where a brand new engineer hire walks in the first day of his work in the office and he brought his parents to show them uh, the, the team. And so they walk in, there's a bunch of naked people in the hot top and he says, yeah, mom, uh, this is the chairman of the board and this is the VP of engineering. And the parents were very shocked. And Nolan was in the hot tub. He said, yeah, hey, come on in, take your clothes off. We're a games company. And Atari, in the early days, they had a very good culture. They were financially very successful, but they had an amazing team culture. They were one of the best places to work for on the planet. And a lot of people applied every day. There were even some people who wanted to work for them for free, just to be part of it. And when I look at companies and startups, a lot of them, when they start out, they have a pretty good culture. And then as they grow larger, the culture changes very often and companies turn into these monsters and zombie companies with a lot of bureaucracy and hierarchies and it takes very long to get, make decisions and get approvals from everything. And it really, the culture is really deteriorating. Uh, the larger the companies get. So the question is, are all companies eventually becoming the victims of their own growth? And will your team, will your company eventually become the victim of your success? I think it doesn't have to be that way because I've seen some examples, they're rare, but I've seen some, some companies that have managed to grow larger and keep a great culture. And that's, for me personally, one of the most fascinating topics. I've been an entrepreneur for 12 years and founded two companies. And I'm always super interested in learning how do companies create a great culture and how do, we, who, how do they keep a great culture. And I talk to other entrepreneurs a lot and ask them, tell me your secret. How do you do it? And I read a lot, every book I can find on the subject. And one of the best research I found on this topic is from the Great Place to Work Institute. Who of you knows the Great Place to Work Institute? So this is an organization from the United States. They've been doing it for 25 years and now across 40 countries where they look at companies, the best companies in the world in terms of workplace and culture. And they look, what do they do in terms of recruiting and how, what processes do they have? What values do they have? And they compare them and benchmark these companies against each other. And I can really recommend to look at their uh, research and what I want to share with you today is my personal take my personal four keys to creating a great culture and keeping it as you grow your team larger and the first key that I found is to understand really what drives people what motivates people especially creative people who of you likes to play card games Okay, so this is a card game that we developed about four years ago. It's a multiplayer card game. And we, it was in December, so we wanted to launch that game before Christmas so that our customers could play it over the Christmas holidays. And there was a lot of stress on the team. And we thought, how can we motivate the team so that they definitely make the deadline before Christmas? And we wanted to give the team a big cash bonus. Everybody on the team would get a bonus if we make the, uh, the deadline. And then the team thought about it for a while and came back and said to us, you know, we don't really want the money because we think it's unfair. It's only five of us on the team. What about the rest of the company? Why don't we get something instead for the whole company if we make the, the deadline? And so we decided 
we will buy this pool billiard table for the whole company if we make the deadline. And from that moment on, it created an amazing dynamic within the whole organization. Everybody was cheering to the team, asking how is it going, everybody was involved. And of course, the project was a big success. And today in, in our lounge, we have this pool billiard table and it's a daily reminder of how the right motivation can really change people and create an amazing energy in a team and in a company. Who of you has read the book Drive from Daniel Pink or seen some of the videos? Okay, this is uh, a lot of research they did on the subject of motivation. How do you motivate especially creative people? And what they found is that money is not uh, one of the biggest motivators. You need to pay your people well, uh, get it off the table, but there's three factors that really drive people and that is autonomy, mastery and purpose. What is autonomy? When I ask people in my team, what is the single most important thing for you in your work? What really motivates you the most? People say, for me, what motivates me the most is when I have, when I can make an impact, when I can make my own decisions and I get responsibilities and I can try out things, I have enough time to experiment and you give me the trust that I, I can do it. That really motivates me. And it's amazing when you start giving people that autonomy and, and trust, they, it's almost as if they want to show to you that they deserve it, that you give it to them. And it creates an amazing energy in people. <laughs> the, the second driver is mastery, especially for the, the, the great people, your, your best talent. These people, they want to be challenged. They want to learn on an ongoing basis and they want to grow. So you have to give people the opportunity to do that within your organization. Initially, we did not think of that too much and we, we made the mistake, we thought it doesn't pay to, to invest in this and give people time um, to, to do this, their own personal development. But now we understand how important it is because especially your, your best people, they will leave if, if you don't give them the opportunity to grow. So now we do a lot of internal talks, best practice sessions, and we get external experts and speakers into the organization that uh, talk to the team and coach everybody. And we also do it on a very individual basis. So we had one team member that wanted to take some time off to, for personal growth, and she just came back from a three-month sabbatical trip around the world. So how many of your organizations do that and, and enable that? That's very important. And we also look at what are the people's strengths. There's this strength finder test from the Gallup organization where you can, everybody in our team can take that test if they want and find out what their strengths are. And then we sit with them and think about how do you want to grow in the next month, in the next years? Um, because many people, they don't want to work on the same game for two years or even do the same job for several years. So we give people that opportunity. We had one Flash developer who was a very good developer, but one day he came and said, I don't want to be a Flash developer anymore. I want to become a game designer. And initially we said, well, but you're not a game designer. Yeah, but I want to try it. It's, I am very passionate about it, and I think I can do it. So we let him try it, and now he's one of our best game designers, and he's with the company for six years. And the third thing is about purpose. It's really, if your goal is to build a five $100 million company or a $1 billion company, that's not motivating people very deeply. You have to have a higher purpose. When, when Steve Jobs was recruiting John Scully from, um, from Pepsi he, to join Apple, and he told him, John, do you want to continue selling sugared water or do you want to join us and change the world? And that's really what, what this purpose means. You have to give people a higher meaning why they do it. And we also lost track of that a little bit in the past where we focused a lot on making more revenues, making more profits. And now we understand how important it is and really bring that into the organization. Why do we do this? We want to make our customers happy. We want to make millions of people smile every day and bring them a, a good time. That's why we do this. So we feed back that information into the organization every day and tell these stories about our customers. I was asking one of our mobile game developers, what, was, what were some of the big moments for you this year? And he said there were several big moments, and one of them was certainly 
when he read a review on the iTunes store about the game that he was uh, designing. And there was this mother, she said she was driving in her car, her son was playing the, the, the game, and he was totally immersed in the game, very happy. And she was happy because uh, her son was quiet in the car, and she was very grateful for that and wanted to share that with us. And when the product manager read that, that made his day. And that's why we also think it's important to have your internal customer service team and we call these customer ninjas, who's part of their job is to bring that information back into the organization and, and bring the vibe into the company. And consider this, how much passion they have to compare it to the typical call center that a lot of large companies have. You don't want to have that. That's, there's no passion. There's no feeling for the, for the purpose. So the second key to creating and keeping a great culture is to get the right people. It's all about the right people. Don't get the wrong people. What are the right people? I heard about a nice story um, where they did a training for top managers, for leaders, and they trained them for several days. And at the end of their training, they tested them. And the final question on the test was, what is the name of your company's janitor? What's the name of your company's janitor? A lot of the managers didn't know because they never talked to the janitor. But that's, that's the point. It's all about the attitude. Are you humble enough? Do you build relationships with everybody in your organization? Because a business is about people. It's about relationships. And that's what we look for when we hire people. We look for their attitude much more than their skill. Because if you have these kind of people in your company with a big ego, they will destroy your team, they will destroy your company. I've seen it many times where just one person like that comes in and the whole team is destroyed. So we make sure we, don't, we get the right people, we don't get these people. There's also very good research on that subject from Dave Logan. He wrote a book, Tribal Leadership, where they analyzed the different mindsets and attitudes of people and how they impact the performance of organizations. And what they found is that companies that have a very strong we culture, team culture, collaborative, outperform by far companies that have a lot of these ego people which have this mindset, yeah, I'm great, but you're not. That's why we make sure we don't, we don't get those people and we have probably one of the most elaborate hiring processes in the industry where we involve the whole team in screening applicants. We bring them in several times. They spend a whole day at the, our office doing sessions with a lot of people. They go to lunch together and at the end of the day, the whole team decides um, whether we should hire them or not and they can veto. If one person says, no, I don't like the person, then we don't hire them and it's probably 60, 70 percent based on their team fit, on their attitude and only a small part is based on their skill. Because we know if you have one bad apple, it can spoil the whole basket. And the, f the third key is then, once you have the right people, you need to have the right team set up so that these people can collaborate and thrive and, and have a creative uh, surroundings where they can work. And one of the learnings for us is you have to have very small teams. Even if you grow large, you have to have small teams. Uh, interestingly, yesterday, VJ from uh, Zynga with Friends was talking exactly about the same topic. They have small teams and they're much more performant and more powerful. It's almost as the size of the team inversely correlates to the performance of the team. Because people in, in a small team, they talk much more on a personal level. They don't send emails. They don't. It's, it's uh, about relationships and they are much more powerful, especially if they have the power, if they're independent and have the autonomy to make their own decisions. And when you have a lot of these small teams, you have to make sure that the teams also talk to each other, that they talk cross the organization, and there's ways you can do that. You have to create places and spaces and events where people come together and talk and, and mingle. Here's an example. We used to have coffee machines on, on all the floors in every area of the company, and now we put them all in one area. Just There's a big lounge where all the drinks are, all the coffee, and everybody has to walk there to get their drinks, and that creates a lot of communication between the different teams, and it's a great way to do that. Another way we do it is every Wednesday we have a team lunch where we randomly mix people from all the different teams together and they all go to lunch together and talk. And it's a great way to mingle. Also the, the office itself, the design of the office is very important. In our old office we had three floors 
and there were stairs outside, so you had to take, go outside and go to another floor. And that really created a culture where people started talking, oh yeah, the, the guys from the upper floor, the, the guys from the lower floor, and really separate the organization. So one of the best investments we made in our new office was to have an internal stair, where now we have only now two floors, larger floors, and they're connected with an internal stair. That really helps communication. And you can also see we have a lot of open spaces, transparency, use a lot of glass. Reminded me a lot about the trial pay office in Palo Alto, which is also, they have a very good culture there. And that has a big impact on the whole environment, on the, on the team culture, and on the vibe of the organization, on their energy. Now, the fourth key is the values of your company. How do you want people to treat each other in your organization? What are your beliefs about people? Because uh, what, what I see in companies that grow larger, you see a lot of this attitude where people say, yeah, I don't care. You know, I just work here. Um, I don't really buy what to do, but I work here. And, and to avoid that attitude, you need to get people's buy-in. And this is a photo of my two co-founders and myself where we have some, some of our values and some of our beliefs that we, from day one, we thought very deep about what, what do we want our company to be? What kind of people do we want? How do we want to treat each other? Because the companies we've worked previously, many of them had a very bad culture and it sucked. And we wanted to build a, a place which is different, which is inspiring, has a positive energy. So here are some of the beliefs that we have. Uh, talk to people, not about them. And be very transparent and explain everything because there's nothing more frustrating for team members when they have to do something and don't know why. Or when they, even worse, is when they have to do something and think it's stupid. And that's really totally frustrating. So we take along, we go a long way and explain everything. Why do we have this rule? Why do we have these goals? Why do we want to do this? And then very openly share the information with everybody. We have we, send, we have an intranet where everybody can read the, the results of our A-B tests and the, the different metrics we have. We have these screens in the office with, with the metrics and we share a lot of information. Even the interns, they can get access to a lot of information in our company. We're very open and that creates that sense of buy-in and uh, ownership of everything and really brings the team together. And we go one step further than that. We do a lot of decisions we do in a democratic way and involve the team, even though it takes longer, in the long run, it, it pays off. And a lot of companies now in the game space do a lot of external metrics. They do A-B testing and cohort an analysis. We do the same thing, and we also do it internally with our team. So we ask the team, how do you feel about the culture? What can we improve? We do a lot of surveys, and it's almost like we apply the design approach to iterative game design to culture. And that results that our culture improves every every year. We get better culture. And I would say now we have a better culture than when we started. And the final point about values is uh, it's about appreciation. How, how much do you praise and how much do you criticize people in your team? How, how much do you create a positive energy in your team? There's uh, some people say CEO actually stands for chief energy officer. You're responsible to create a positive energy. And the ideal ratio, that's what they found out, of praise versus critic is eight to one. So you have to praise people eight times more than you give them negative feedback. And most companies do it the other way around. And that creates a very negative attitude. And it has to be authentic and you have to really show people that you care. I remember there was a scrum review meeting and the CEO was in that meeting and the team afterwards said, wow, that was great that he was sitting here and appreciating our work and it felt really good when, when he was taking time and, and looking at that. It's also about listening more than you talk. A lot of executives, they talk a lot, but they don't listen and listening is a form of appreciation for people. So here's Nolan Bushnell again and you can see he now has a bigger hot top than 1974. But there's one interesting thing he said. He said, Everybody who's ever been in a hot tub or taken a shower has had a great idea. That's not the hard part. The hard part is really to get out of the water and then act upon that idea. And that's when you need to understand how, how people are motivated and you have to have the right people and you have to, write the, have to have the right team set up and you have to have the right values in the company. So there's a lot more to learn about that fascinating topic 
And I invite you to take a look at our, we have this internal website, insightgame.com, where we have a video about our team, about our office. We have a lot of information about our values and what we do. Or you can also send me an email and invite me for a beer because I love to talk about this topic. It's really great. Thanks.